listening to The Donor Doctor Show, where your host, James Newberry, will help you improve the health of your fundraising. Now over to Jane. Hello, this is The Donor Doctor, and I'm with my friend, uh, Stuart McLean, and this is our 50th podcast. Not you and I together, but my 50th. Yay! Now, of course, uh, I'm a little bit leery of mentioning that because most people just don't care about anniversaries. Am I right about that? Unless it's your wedding anniversary. That's right. You people are they're not they're focused on their own life. They really don't care. A lot of groups, I think, oversell their anniversaries. Now, you know, there's exceptions. If you're uh, ASPCA, for instance, had their 150th anniversary last year, Did and they, they have an, they have an interesting story. It was founded by this guy Henry Berg who saw a horse being abused and he thought it was wrong and he you know he was part of a bigger movement uh it's a spinoff of the the english the british society of production which goes all the way back to william wilberforce if you remember him he was a great abolitionist absolutely so i mean if you have an interesting story like that clara barton uh red cross i mean that's one thing but if it's just your 15th anniversary i wouldn't make too big a deal out of it that's what i'm trying to say so I think you're a wise man. <laughs> so we're not making that big a deal out of the 50th that. But, but for me, it, it, is a, it is a milestone. My, my goal was to make 50 podcasts when I started out. So now we're uh, well, free rolling, so to speak. You know, it's not just you, because since I've been on some of your podcasts, I've had people run up to me as if I was a rock star or something. Really? Yes. <laughs> and they've said, I've listened to the podcast. One guy said, I live for these. Oh, really? Yeah, I had lunch with him. I used to work with him, and he wanted to have lunch with me uh, about a month ago. And uh, he was just effused with excitement because uh, he wants to get into the creative end instead of uh, just lists. Oh, well, and, that's perfect uh, for him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good podcast for him. And then I've had uh, people I've used to work with who've been in the business for a long time. They'll come up. And uh, they look all excited, and they say, oh, yeah, I've been listening to the podcasts, and I heard you on them, Stuart. Well, you've been very good. You know, you're uh, the one on Reagan Library in Mount Vernon, uh-huh. and that's that was a popular one. It had uh, like 200 listeners. Really? But the involvement device one didn't have as many as I thought, and I think that was actually the best one. Uh, so I'd, I'd encourage you. But you know, it's interesting to me. A lot of times the ones I consider the best mm-hmm. are not... I guess people don't listen, so they don't know. Uh, well, you know, uh, my biggest fan of all of this was my teenage daughter. Oh, yeah. yeah you told us about I that. When I told her yeah. that I was on a podcast and yeah. her ears Well, young up. people like the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to business here. N- enough about us. Uh, I got this idea for the one we're doing today, Joan Throckmorton, because when her name came up uh, around a week or so ago, I could see you light up. You really have a passion and excitement about her, don't you? Joan Throckmorton would be one of the four people I would put on my Mount Rushmore of great direct marketers, historic. Direct well, name marketers. the others too. I've done a show on that, so. Uh, oh, I I would certainly put John Caples in yes, there. Yeah, he belongs there. Uh, I really like, uh, he, he just died recently, unfortunately. Herschel Gordon, Gordon Lewis. Yeah, and you mentioned Claude Hopkins, too, I think. Claude Hopkins also. I think I read his book more than once. Uh, he made such an impression on me early on. And uh, uh, he's written a couple of books. And uh, I uh, I really owe a lot. If, if, I, if I have... Uh, Developed as much as I have in this business over the decades, an awful lot goes to those four people. Right. And I had the opportunity to uh, uh, hear Herschel Gordon Lewis speak in front of the Direct Marketing Association of Washington. Uh, I got to attend two different seminars with Joan Throckmorton, uh, one where I in D.C. and then the other up in New York at the uh, DMA. Right. Uh, that was a two-day seminar, as I recall. How many uh, students were in there? Uh, about twenty. And you were said fifteen. The other one, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's a. They missed out. And you and you and she autographed your book, right? It was the book is winning, winning, winning direct, direct response advertising. How right. to recognize it, evaluate it, inspire, inspire it, it, and create, create it. it. I remember that this. That book, when I was reading it, was a lot like when I took 
ancient philosophy when I was in college. Because mm -hmm. if you really get into some of those ancient philosophers, their brain power is incredible. Right. And I could read, I don't know, 30 pages or something. Uh, and I had a professor who was educated at Oxford. And I would be in his class for 75 minutes. And I had to go take a break after that and go to sit at the student union for an hour just because my head was like a light bulb and uh, burning and I couldn't take it anymore. The, the, the thoughts and the deep, you know, richness of uh, learning to think. Uh, Joan Throckmorton's book was like that for me. I could only, as much as I, I, I looked forward to picking well, it up. It came out in 1986, which would be around when you were starting your direct mail career. Correct? Yeah, and uh, I would look forward. It was, it was like a good novel for me that I'm excited. I wanted to see what happens next. Uh, but I could only read a chapter at a time. It's probably the better way to do it. You want to read forensically. You don't want to read, like, skimming. Well, that's a good point, because she would get me firing off like firecrackers or bottle rockets, ideas going off in every direction as I would go page by page and illustration by illustration. And I remember early in my career going down to a direct marketing association of Washington luncheon, and the speaker was Guy Yolton. Uh -huh. He owned his own direct marketing agency for years in the D.C. area. Uh, I had had the opportunity to uh, meet him and his wife at uh, a gathering that my employer was holding at the time before this. And I had just started freelancing and just started reading Joan's book. And he was going to talk about the book. That's why I went to hear about it. And I remember him talking to the audience there. And he used, he held up the book and he, he used the term breakthrough. Oh yeah, I like he that. He called it a breakthrough. So those of you out there who do not have Winning Direct Response Advertising by Joan Throckmorton, uh, I urge you to get it. I think you're right. I think, I think a common mistake is that people do get the masters, if they're any good. They'll, they'll, they'll read Caples and uh, uh, Hopkins. And that's like from 1920 or whatever, 1930. Yes. And then they'll maybe read something last week. Uh, and they'll think, well, anything before the Internet's, you know, out of date. Well, no, they, <laughs> it hasn't changed. Marketing concepts haven't changed. So, you, you know, you're making a mistake to, for, to forget things from like the 1980s. And somebody starting younger... You, you know, you, you, you might think this is dated. It's really not. There's nothing in here that's dated. No, in fact, if I uh, were a, today were a business professor at some university, I would use Throckmorton's book as a graduate student's course uh, outline, really. And this would be a, a required text. And uh, if it was out of print, I, I have since found out that you can get out of print books reprinted in quantities like 3,000 or something. Right. But I, I would get it reprinted so that my students could have it. Well, I've had the book a long time ago, so I, I don't know. I've had it for like at least 30 years. Well, it looks like it, Jim. It does. It does. It's well worn, Poor as thing. you can see. Uh, anyway, Joan Throckmorton died in 2003. Um, she's in the Direct Mail Hall of Fame. This are some of the things that uh, uh, she said in her book. There's no reason to fail in direct, direct response marketing. Uh, yet, of course, we all fail. I mean, she's probably saying it overall because you can test. You did actually a test with Joan, isn't that correct? Yeah, uh, we had uh, started a new section of our company that we didn't know a whole lot about. It was financial newsletter publishing. And I so admired a direct mail piece that her agency had put out. What was the teaser on that one? Something it was, uh, do you have what it takes to be a millionaire? Do you have what it takes to be a millionaire? Great teaser, yeah. I think that's, you know, that's kind of like a challenge to you. Right. Because everybody kind of wants to make money and, uh, you know, rather than saying something like double your money in six months or so something. So overdone. So yes. overdone. Yes, yes. Do you have uh, what it takes? Yeah. You know, do you have what it takes? Oh, because you you don't know. You don't know. And you're wondering, you know, what what do they yeah. have that I don't? Do they have something that I don't? And yeah, no, it's it's something you definitely have to to open. And so uh, I actually had gotten that package 
at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to stop and read it. And you got to understand when I look at mail, when I get it at home, I'm not just looking at it, okay, bill, you know, birthday letter from my mother, card, uh, you know, uh, trash, trash, trash. The stuff that most people would trash, I might save one or two of them just because of the carrier envelope because I want to look at it. Right. And I have carrier envelopes home that I threw out everything else that's inside of it, but I kept the carrier. Right, right. Because it stopped me. Uh-huh. So it grabbed your attention. It sure did. That's good. Well, anyway, the... Uh but, but your project wasn't successful. And my, my, my point is we all fail from time to time. Her package failed. Yeah. So uh, even a great like Joan Throckmorton can, can fail is what, I, what I'm trying to say. You and I can fail. And so I, I just want people that are listening, if, if you have one that, that fails, learn from your mistake and try to do better next time because we're all going to strike out every now and then. That's, that's I, when, I, when my packages go south, I do what I call a, a post-mortem. That's a good idea. And I figure out what happened. Was it the response rate? Was it the average order or gift or membership fee? Uh, did I ask for too much? Did I ask for too little? Uh, was I not motivational enough? Uh, which would tell me that the response rate wasn't so good. I've also experimented with most people think of back-end premiums uh, is just something to get the order, you know, a little extra thing to, uh, or in fundraising to increase the average gift. I've done both. I've used the same premium to goose response and the average gift. Right. Uh, have a fast response bonus. I actually borrowed that from the financial newsletter publishing industry and used it in fundraising and membership. Yeah, it works well. And it works. Yeah, absolutely. She said there's a dearth of creative talent. Do you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> I'm surprised it took so long for you to I didn't know how to be... <laughs> well, there's a lot of mediocrity out there. How to be gentle, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm the end-all. Let me say right now that I have my failures. Mm -hmm. I sure do. Uh, and our audiences that we're sending out our appeals to right. keep us humble. Yes. They keep us humble. And, uh, but yes. And you know what I really can't stand? What's that? Is mediocrity that doesn't care that it's mediocre. Yeah. They don't want to read Throckmorton or Caples. You can't, there's no hope for somebody like that. They, I've had people where I was assigned to be their mentor and I knew I was in trouble early on when they're just tapping their foot, well, is this how you do it? And I'm trying to help them think through their package. I remember one person, and you gave the answer, it depends. Yes. And he was frustrated because he wants it to be all black or white. He's, I guess, a technician. He has no, no real passion. He just wants it to be, he wants everything to be black or white. And his marketing is just not that way. No, and uh, yes, does there need to be urgency? Does there need to be attention gilded? building or yeah, getting that, that, that's, uh, that's true. all of those things but there's different ways to get there and he didn't want to learn the different ways he wanted to know oh I plug this in here and I plug that in there and this is the way you do it well if that was the way you do it every time we don't need you we'll just program the computer to do it well I know this person I've read the writing and, and it, it's very formulaic like that that's interesting. And they're prolific, but it's prolific crap. I mean, it's, it's, none of it's any good. I ran into somebody recently uh, who uses uh, freelance talent. Mm -hmm. And they said, gee, I don't know how some of these people do it. They turn out something in a day or an afternoon. Well, you know what? They're not putting much time into it. No, and I got to see some of their work. Because uh, an agency that I do some work with currently was up against them. Right. And every one of their attempts, and there was like three or four, failed. Right. But the ones that the agency I was doing some work with, and not all of them were my packages, but some of them were, 
our stuff was working. Because you're putting some time into it. One thing Joan talks about is she talks about writing in stages. You write, you know, uh, just just kind of without without picking your, your lead sentence or just, just start writing. But she says it's key, and Herschel Gordon Lewis says the same thing. You've got to come back to it. You've got to let it stew. You've got to let your unconscious kind of think about it. So the idea of writing in one afternoon is crazy. How are you going to write? You need time to think about it. Even when you're doing other things, you're, you're the back of your mind is thinking about it. Maybe in you know, brushing your teeth, you'll come up with the idea. The other day, I came up with a name for a special project that you liked. But it, didn't, it, it, it took a couple days to just kind of think about it. I wasn't thinking about it. It just sort of the back of my mind I was thinking about it. Your mind might work the same. You've got to come back with a fresh eyes. You see what the weakness of your package is. The idea of doing it in one afternoon is a, is a poor idea if you're trying to do quality work. No, and the sad thing here, uh, I've had an employer, I heard him talking to my immediate supervisor. He wasn't talking about me, thank goodness. But he said, and I quote, if it takes longer than 10 hours to write the direct mail package, there's something wrong with your copywriter. Are you kidding me? And all the time that you put in coming up with that project name that I really admire, you are probably going to be in violation if you probably put... Well, I don't, I don't know if it's actual work because you just got it in the back of your mind. No, but, but you took time. Th that's the key. I, I got a freelance thing and I probably only put 10 hours into it. But what I liked was because he was, he was in the summer, he was going to be away on vacation for a while. And um, he... He gave me time to think about it. You could go away and come back. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's really good. Um, he talks about being the skill of an actor. So she talks about the skill of an actor. Did you, did you hear about that? What do you think about that? And one of the best copywriters we ever uh, knew was uh, Ben Brannock. Remember, he was an actor. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking uh, she said that, although it's been a little while since I've read that, I'm thinking she's trying to say, put yourself into the skin of your character that you're writing for. Right. And also try to empathize with your audience and understand what their motivations are. Well, empathy's big. I, one thing she also says is the Renaissance quotient, your RQ, and she gives you a test. But this is, a, you, you think of Renaissance quotient as maybe being highbrow. Yeah. But a lot of it's like reading Mademoiselle, <laughs> maybe the Enquirer, kind of having a broad range of things, broader than just highbrow, you know, just, just a... Oh, uh, I, I remember a, a movie I saw once where they were, uh, they had a screenwriter, and he kept trying to be very highbrow, and the studio head looked at him and he said, you're just, you're just not relating to what the audience is going to be. And uh, the guy, the writer, rolled his eyes and he said, yeah, yeah, me, Tarzan, you, Jane. And the studio head looked at him calmly and he said, you remembered. <laughs> he said, the reason I'm good in this job is because I have the same taste as the guy buying tickets out there. Right. Well, that's, that's key. That's key. Um, in in uh, Chapter 2, she talks about repeat sales. And, of course, we talk about repeat gifts, retention as being a big, big issue. And retention rates are going down. Do you have any thoughts on why that is? Yes. Uh, it's because people are so bombarded with messages today. And it's gotten worse since I've gotten in the business. It didn't, you know... When I got in the business, there was no email. Sure. Now you get email. Right. You get your postal mail. You get uh, radio and TV. You get print. Uh, you'll, uh, even po especially political campaigns, uh, they love sending out uh, tweets. And, you know, it just, it just doesn't end, uh, right. the numbers. So yeah, you, you get to a point where you're just on overload. And you have to tune it out. And I think that's part of the problem. Right. Well, um, one of the things she says, I, I know you agree with, you test only one thing at a time. Otherwise, you really don't have a real test if you have two variables. Um, 
She says, don't run a big sail into the ground by the overuse of last chance. There's the, you know, it, it, if you have like uh, a deadline, then it's last chance is authentic. But you don't say last chance if they have six months to get the, to resubscribe to a magazine, for instance. I mean, it's o overuse of hurry and last chance. There was a, uh, a Persian rug seller here in greater DC. Oh, always going out of business. <laughs> and every six, eight months I'm driving in on the radio, uh, going out of business sale. And I thought, oh, those poor guys, but they're being smart. You know, they are telling people it's going out of business. That's very, you know, they could, they got to get rid of the inventory. Well, then I'd hear it again. Oh, and it's the same one. I mean, it's the same. It's the same one. Your name? <laughs> same one. I I still remember the name of them too. I won't say that's, it now, but it's, it it is offensive. I mean, that's been so overdone that uh, it it harms the technique. It's a good technique, um, but it's been uh, abused. She says the secret weapon is to read customer uh, correspondence. We call it donor mail, and it, she says that's a lot more valuable than focus groups, which she's suspicious of because people. Um, just as people want to be highbrow in their um, in their taste, or say they're more highbrow than they are, what people say in a focus group is probably not how they really reflect their real views. And I think they're also trying to I mean they know they're being under a camera, and right. they're also got other people in the group, and they don't want to look foolish. Right. So I think there'll be a lot of group think there. Absolutely. Uh, I do like to read the comment mail with the new promotion. And I have learned things from it, mm -hmm. and uh, some of it positive. Oh, I, I I get it. Some of it just confirmed what I thought. Right. But I want. I shouldn't say just because it tells me I'm on the right track. Right. If somebody cared enough to not just throw away your piece, but to write back to you, whether you had an order or a donation, right. or not. Maybe you better take a few minutes out of your busy day and at least read. Give them a hearing. Uh, that's valuable information. I've used it more than once. I, I agree with you. Uh, I like this advice. Don't make it hard to contact you. A lot of times people design packages and they forget to put the right address there or phone number. Uh, you know, I'm finding that to be intentional now. Really? Oh, yes, uh, especially with some of the larger companies out there. Uh, they don't want you to talk to a real person. Because that costs more money. Yes, they want you to push three. Right. Push two. Hmm. In order to better serve you, please choose from the following options by the way in case i in case you want to contact me <laughs> yeah i'm Push i, I can be buttons. i can be reached at the donor doctor show at gmail.com or you can uh, text me at 240-477-3999 so you see i gave both a web and phone application which is a good idea for groups i think you you want to you you want to encourage that contact if you're a charity. I think it's a mistake for these the way they're doing that. And I think every piece of information, um, you, you want to make it so that um, that if you if you if they lost the reply envelope, that they could tell from the reply how to contact you. And and maybe if they were, if they lost the just had the letter, they could contact you too. You want to make it so that each thing can stand up. I have contact information on the bottom of page one of my letter. Right. I have it on my reply, and I always have some sort of return envelope there with the address on it. And uh, so you got three different places to find how to respond on there. Right. That's, that's good. She, would, she, would be, she says that's good. Chapter three, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your views here. She says... It's 75% technique and 25% creativity. And, of course, the first thing I thought of, because I've seen you use a lot of techniques that you created. Aren't they kind of uh, overlapping there? Isn't your uh, technique part of the creative process? Absolutely. Uh, I've had some things that uh, I've gone off the reservation, if you will. Right. Uh, I, 
I was uh, brought in, oh, we got to save a penny here and a half a cent there. And even the production people, oh, we're going to ship this over there and then they're going to personalize it over here. And we're all going to end up saving a penny and a half per piece. Uh, how exhausting. I'm not in favor of spending any more money than we have to for our clients, but I think you need to spend money on the right things. And I have had, uh, you know, uh, things where I've spent a lot more money than the typical direct mail package. In fact, once I happened to be in my supervisor's office and the cost for what I was just mailing just got posted on the company yeah, intranet. Yeah, I remember the story. <laughs> and while I'm sitting there in her office, the company CFO calls her from his office on the phone. And I knew he was talking about what I did because of the questions that she was answering, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't on speaker. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I believe in this, but it better work. Otherwise... They are just going to ream me and shake their heads and right. what were you thinking? And uh, I don't remember what the uh, concern was once. It was rare for my employer. It wasn't over that appeal, but it was over something I did. No one ever criticized the stuff that worked. But I remember once I tried something that was a little bit different and my employer was saying to me, because we had monthly right. reviews, about how things are going for the clients. And he started to chew on me. And I looked at him after I gave him his hearing. He didn't say anything that changed my mind. He just, you know, you blah, 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 and you broke this rule or, you know, cost too much, you know, whatever it was. And I said, if you want breakthroughs yeah, like such and such, yeah. and such and such and such and such and such and such, Right. You have to give me the freedom to fail. Absolutely. That's a, that's a key that's a key point. And it's one thing if somebody's a rookie and unproven, you probably you you do want to shepherd them, you know what I mean? Yes. But, but if somebody is your star, uh, you know, if you're like the star baseball player, they'll let you hit on 3 and 0. If you're the best hitter on the team, you know. Yeah. And the guy puts it right down the plate, you, you, some, you know, you have sometimes you have that right. Uh, you've earned that right. Yes. And so, and, and occasionally you'll hit into a double play doing that. So, you know, you just comes with the territory. <laughs> you have to accept that. She talks about the four P's. Now, m more common, of course, is AIDA, which is attention, interest, desire, action. But the four P's I'd never heard of, and that was picture, which is like in the involvement or attention, promise, prove, and push. Of course, the push is they ask for the gift. So I thought that was an interesting one. I had never heard of. Uh, talked a lot about tokens that, that are popular and scratch-off coverings. Which probably, probably don't use a lot in fundraising. I have seen them some. Um, of course, stickers I've talked a lot about. Uh, I thought, love this one. I talked about limited supply. And this, they changed it. They said uh, limited to two per order. And 45% more people ordered two than before. Because you limited it to two, you actually really? get more. Yeah, so it's an interesting psychological one. You know, I, I kind of like that because think about the, all the car commercials, you know. I once heard Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld talking about the Chevy Lumina. Right. And uh, it was the Chevy Lumina Limited. And he looked at the audience and he said, yeah, what is it limited to? Like 50 million -a? <laughs> and it just isn't real anymore. Well, that's what she talks about. It's a not lot. real. It's not. It's just not authentic. If it was truly limited, if there was a reason for it being limited, and you wouldn't want a, a car like that, maybe some kind of convertible with a fancier make, you know, like uh, you know, Mercedes had a special line of only ten thousand of some kind, some kind of, you know. That's limited. You know, that makes sense. Where each one's numbered. You know, where you really do something limited. That I get. But, but it's, 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 it's kind of like the cheap jackets for members only. You remember that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing fancy. What, what kind of member? Are you a country club member? <laughs> it's, <laughs> you see, you see, Where's you see, my Kmart sweatshirt? <laughs> you see all these people at the Golden Corral with for members only. I mean, come on. It's, it's crazy. Uh, who falls for that? Uh, anyway, uh, one thing she talked about, you must be able to spot a week off, or well, I agree with that one. 
Uh, clarity is vital. Remember, people don't read carefully, so you need to be skimmer friendly. And just like you were talking about the address needs to be in several, several places, you need to have the same offer in several different places so that no matter where they start, because not everybody starts at, you know, uh, at, at the beginning of the letter. Some people start at the PS. Some people read the reply first. Some people read your insert or lift letter first. You don't know what people are going to do. Obviously, a lot of people are going to read your, the envelope if you have teaser copy for, even before that. So you don't know how, and you have to think about that when you're writing it. They're not going to all be reading it like you wrote it or like you intended. So you have to kind of have a strategy, you know, <clears throat> but, you know we've talked about that before. Um, odd numbers are more credible. I think we've talked about that before. Of course, that's probably more for commercial uh, you know, where something's priced, something like yeah, that. Yes, although I've run into it in my early days of uh, political fundraising. I actually got numbers from a client, and they wanted to spend $100,000 in sudden such a state on TV to defeat Senator so-and-so. And then you made it like 97800 And And my mentor, who was going through line by line... It's Jim and Eric, right? Yes, of my stuff with a red pencil... That's a good way to do it. And line by line. And he said, is it really $100,000? I said, yes. He said, call them up and ask if it could be ninety eight, right, or something, because 100000 sounds like you didn't put much thought into it. She talks a little about fundraising. Um, you need a clear and Im imminent need, it's particularly talking about political fundraising. Um, you want to say give all you can, but any amount will help, so you, so you don't want to turn off the smaller donors. Um, yeah, my wife, who is in the fundraising area, she had a nice phrase that I ended up using quite frequently and still do. What's that? Uh, it's uh, every contribution is welcome and appreciated. Oh, I like that. Yeah. You know, I really want your $25, Jim. Welcome but and every contribution is welcome and appreciated. Uh, she's a, Jones Rockmore is a fan of direct mail. She says it's more exciting than TV, which just runs counter to, to I know a lot, what a lot of people think. Um, she thinks it's the learning ground that locks all the creative secrets. It's more flexible than a commercial, TV commercial, which is confining to 30 seconds or 60 seconds at most. Um, it's pure one-on-one -on -one communication. It's easy to test. There are a lot of reasons that she likes direct mail better than TV. Advertising. In my opinion, if you can do really good direct mail commercial, or even more so, direct mail fundraising, uh, because then you're really selling the wants and the desires, and you're not you're usually having a product that the person is physically going to get, uh, although you might get some sort of a souvenir sure. or something on the back end, you can go ahead and write TV and radio. Uh, I've done TV, mm. two-minute-long TV spots. Yeah, I, I, I've done a couple ads. Yeah. And the fact of it is uh, they were accepted by my supervisor and the client right away. And I don't think it's because I'm so wonderful. I think it's because I had my background in direct, right. direct mail. Right, right. The visual image is real important, obviously, in TV. Uh, but if you, know, if you do animal mailings, it's very important in that. And, uh, and in museums as well. Well, you know, I'll just add to that because I was, you know, I, I respect people who are lifelong students. And I don't want to take up a lot of the time here with this story, but there was a guy I worked with, Craig Cap, Oh, yeah. Who came out of uh, an agency sure. advertising background. And he put in pictures in his direct mail right, fundraising right. letters, which I had never done. And that was all. Oh, that was verboten. And, and, and why uh, was it? Because it looked less personal in your, in your yes, and, and, and it did. But it's still the pictures are so powerful. Sometimes, but it he had the he was, it. Yeah. He, it was like sitting down with a friend, and they're showing you pictures of their family, or their vacation, or How something. How personal can that be? Yes, yeah, that's real personal. And he had captions, and I went to him, and I started to warm up to what he was doing, and uh, he, I said, you know, Craig, I said your direct mail reminds me of print ads and he looked up from his desk and he said one word thank you yeah that's two words <laughs> that's two thank words. you yeah. thanks <laughs> thank you anyway this is what she says about envelopes she says a small detail can make a big difference and uh, that's why you need to be real careful if you don't know what you're doing she talks about mailbox ennui you know what that is 
oh, I remember the phrase, but yet I do not know. <laughs> uh, too much stuff for your prospect to assimilate. It's just, you know, so busy. It, just, it doesn't inspire people. Ennui really means to inspire, but the way what she said was uh, just too much stuff. You've seen, seen envelopes that are too busy. Although you tend to do envelopes that are busier than I do. I mean, we kind of maybe part way on that on that issue. Although, I mean, you know, I've seen it work for you, so I'm not saying it's wrong. Oh, I've got something out right now. It's like a billboard on I know, either I side. Know, I know. It's, but you can pull it off. I, I feel uncomfortable with that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're maybe I just don't have that skill. That's not me. <laughs> well, it has to be about something. I mean, it's like that guy who who is this the way to do it? You know, it might be this time, it might, might not be and, next time. And there are multiple ways to get there too, aren't there? Yes. You know, there should be. If, if yes. your cause is such that you have to write the perfect letter to make it work, boy, I don't look forward to you because you're going to have a hard time in the future down the, you know, if it has to be the perfect letter to 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 make the sale, I I think that uh, you're always looking for those basics, and that's right. getting the attention on the carrier. And sometimes it means you got a double billboard. Sometimes it means it's sparse, and sometimes there's a happy medium that's in right. between. She gives a list of different ones. Um, one is the important envelope, and and that's maybe. Um, makes it look like it's a bill or something. I, I'm not a real big fan of this one. Uh, I saw the DNC got in trouble because they did one. Somebody, some some uh, uh, newspaper wrote an article because it looked like, you know, last chance, final notice or something like that. And people, you know, it looks like a bill. I, I don't know why you need to do that. I saw another one where uh, a guy put sex, sexual registry in clothes. I, I don't think it makes fundraisers look good. I, I have uh, a problem with it. I'm shaking my head right now at those I don't things. Care for it. Although I, you know, the maxi competition, there was one for a pro-life group that said um, medical invoice enclosed, and it was you remember Planned Parenthood was charging for body parts or something of this sort. Yes. I, mean, I don't want to be imprecise, but it was something along yes. those lines. That's there's enough truth to that that I don't have a problem with it. I, I would I would say that's okay with me. Sexual registry, no. It's offensive. People will think your neighbor's going to think that you're part of a pervert. I think it's wrong to do it. I think it reflects badly. Um, the political party that put one out, final notice, no, I don't, I don't like that either. I'm even, even though I approve of, of what the pro life group did, I probably would not give it an award. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's just, just, just. Because I still even think that it's the difference between what you should do for a client and what you should give an award in my book. And what you should give an award is stuff that makes the business look good. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong on that. I mean, you know, you're, you're free to think. But I definitely think it's wrong to do the sexual registry enclosed and do the final notice when it has nothing to do with the bill. I don't like that kind of stuff. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I think you said a Democratic committee. It was a DNC that did it. Democratic DNC. Committee. You know, people don't like to be fooled. Right. And I think those those things where you see another example of that is an envelope. And a lot of times it's a banker's envelope where it's tinted on the inside. Right. But there'll be a big window and it says pay to the order of and your address is in there. Right. So, oh, it's a check. Right. So I'm getting a refund for something or whatever. And you open it up, and they're really trying. It, it is. It, it might really be a check, but it's uh, a loan. It's a check, you know, for ten thousand dollars. And if you cash it, you know, now you're going to have a usurious, you know, level of. Uh, I don't. I. I really have problems with stuff like that. Uh, I've seen fundraisers try to make things look like a check. And uh, I remember my boss, we had one that went out years ago and it didn't do well. And she said, maybe it's because people, and I'm, I appreciate her doing a postmortem. She said, maybe it is but people don't like being fooled. Yeah, I, I, I think you've said enough on it. I think you've got to be careful if you're going to go down that road. Now, I have done matching check packages. Oh, I don't have a problem with a matching check. I don't even. I think there was enough truth to the medical invoice. I don't have a problem with that one. The other two, uh, I have a problem with. The DNC one does not make sense at all to me because they have 
uh, an unpopular president. You, you know, you could put Trump on there. I don't understand why you would want to fool people. Maybe they have numbers. I don't have access to their numbers. Maybe this worked for them. But, uh, uh, you know, I don't care for it. I, I can say that. that whether I think they had a better Trump card, if you will, using yeah. Trump. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I don't understand there was a why really you would want to... There was a successful uh, House appeal for, I think it was the DNC, and it might have been in the 100 Greatest Direct Mail Letters of All Time in that book. Uh, and it, it simply said, it was just before the election, so it was all pre-sold. You didn't have to explain yeah. a lot. And it said, uh, dear so-and-so, uh, I have two reasons why you should send one final campaign check before the November election to the Democratic National Committee, colon, Richard Nixon, Spiro Ag. Okay, there you are. That's <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Very good. But both, both left office. Yeah, anyway, there's a couple other ones. Uh, the promise envelope, it's like you were invited. She said the best promise envelope is, of course, a free gift. Um, the challenging envelope, like only one in four will qualify for this opportunity, or, or the one you said with, with her. Do you have what it takes to be a millionaire? Yeah, that's a challenge. That's yeah, a tell-it-all envelope. Of course, you could spill your guts one, I guess. The mysterious envelope, or it just says RSVP. Uh, the blind envelope, uh, which you just kind of... You're not, you know, it's not clear who it's from. So people open up. We talk about like emails that have no subject lines. They tend to get opened. Although you do alienate some people because you didn't let people know. She says that labels are bad. And, uh, you know, nobody uses labels anymore. You know the only people use labels? Like a small church or Boy Scout troop. So I actually don't think labels are the worst anymore because they're so rarely used. I don't think that they're the Yesterday, worst. Yeah. my daughter has a, she just went off to her freshman year at college. Right. I went online and ordered 250 address labels for her, some that I'm going to give to her grandparents and So she can write family. more easily letters? So and, Yeah, so that they can send her oh, I see, I see. mail yeah. easily. Yeah, so so labels, because they're so, it's probably not true anymore. What was 30 years ago, labels were the worst. But that's probably not true now. It's so rarely used. Well, I think she's talking about Cheshire labels. Yeah, yeah. The four up Cheshire labels. Yeah, but like a church might do that. They might send its members on a label. And, it might. And, uh, well, I mean, I noticed it. I opened it. It almost got in my pile A because the church doesn't send you that many communications. You know what I'm saying? They're no. Not so it was practically my pile A, more so than not. I just, I just throw that out there. Yeah. Is that these rules can change over time. She said at that time, you know, that uh, hand addressed or hand addressed is bigger now than it was back then because because they look more credible, and you have auto pen and you have things like that. So what what works is is evolving all the time. Is the only point I'm trying to make. Uh, every letter should come from someone. I know you agree with that. Uh, letters are the most important pa- part of package, other than carrier. So it's interesting. She's saying the carrier is more important than the letter. Which I don't disagree, but this is this is counter to what most people believe. Well, that's actually what I was taught when I got into this, was that the carrier was the most important. Well, you know, maybe people are taught that, but they don't act that way. You know what I mean? You can be taught something, and you can even, even recite that. But if you look at the way, they don't spend that much time on the carrier, much time thinking. I, gr- I grant you it doesn't take as much work, but there's not a, an attention to detail. I mean, you'll see something like a, a blue uh, auto like pen, and they'll put it in another ink with a different font. You know, I mean, just some things that are totally irrational. Um, uh, a, a personal letter because it's in pink stationery, but it's in a number ten window envelope, eight and a half by eleven. Nobody has stationery that size, and nobody puts it in a business envelope. I mean, it's just illogical. They're not putting much thought into it. I mean, uh, and, and I brought this to somebody's attention, and they weren't even upset by it. I mean, you know, it was like, okay, then you really don't have a, you don't, you really are not making an effort to have standards, is, is what it told me. I remember a year ago writing something for an agency that I was ghosting for, and my contact there uh, kept saying, oh, this is going to be your letter, your letter, I'm just giving you some thoughts. And I could tell she kind of resented having to give me the thoughts. And the truth was, she wanted me to do what she wanted to do. I could just tell by the edge in her voice. Right. And so I listened to her, and I heard her out, and I thought about what she said. And basically, I summed it up, and I said, you know, 
by sending this, what you propose in a window envelope, it's no longer really a personal letter. Right. You keep using the word personal. Who uses a window envelope for their wedding invitation or for a Christmas card or a birthday card or a right. get well card? You know, nobody. Yeah, and the matching cost isn't that much. It just doesn't make much sense. No, it, it just does. It's just not logical to do that. It's just uh, it's it's this excessive interest in keeping costs down, but you're but you're losing all the credibility. I mean, you you could you could instead of being in pile A, now you're in pile B. Oh, that's junk mail. I mean, you know, it's it's. Would it's, you it's, rather be in pile A and spend an extra twenty percent per package? But we're not even talking about or that. Or would much. you rather be in pile B or in the junk? Right. We're not even talking about twenty percent. You're talking about maybe a penny and a half. Yeah, you're talking about two percent. It 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 really doesn't make much sense. Well, anyway, we're, we've gone long here, uh, but I want to talk about a couple things. One is the Johnson box. So she mentioned, of course, she has Frank Johnson uh, was the inventor of the Johnson box, and uh, he of course wrote that appeal, the the Nature Conservancy uh, control. One of his famous ones was well, that, that goofy crane. The crane, yeah, and. Uh, the bug-eyed bird on our envelope who, uh, who's ogling you with such distemper has a point. He's a Native American sandhill crane, and you may be sitting on top of one of his... Uh, nesting sites. Nesting sites, yes. As he sees it, every time our human species has drained a marsh and plowed it or, or built a city on it since 1492 or so, there went the neighborhood. It's enough to make you edgy. So, <laughs> so it was interesting. It was a, a humor. Interestingly... Um, Frank Johnson, he, he says the inventor, he says nobody really invents things. He's, he got that idea uh, from uh, books, uh, like in the 19th century, that might have a, a synopsis of what it was about in that. Uh, and, and that's basically it. The Johnson box, the reason it was created is if you had a good story, but you also had an attractive offer. How to you, you know, be hard to, to bring that in there. So the Johnson box, which goes above the salutation, would maybe have the offer yep. or an involvement device, whatever it is, and you could get into your story. Yep. Now, I had some, some young person, I, and had been in the business for three or four years and didn't know what a Johnson box was. And I gave them a hard time, and they thought I was being. Uh, I mean, don't when you think General somebody, Patton, did you slap that poor <laughs> no, young copywriter? They should have been. They should have been. <laughs> How could you not know a Johnson box if you've been in the business? I mean, as a t as a failure of your training program, you haven't read things. Yep. If you don't know what a Johnson box is. I'm not kidding. Oh, that's the stuff above the salutation. Estrada Martin know. once said, what we have here is a failure to communicate. You don't, you haven't been taught. You obviously haven't read enough. If you are somebody who doesn't know the Johnson box. Shame. It's a sign, um, it's a sign you don't know enough. I mean, in the debates. Especially after four years. Yeah. In the debates, when Donald Trump didn't know about the nuclear triad. Yeah. Um. I, I said I wasn't going to vote for him. Air, right land, and sea. Yeah, when he didn't know or didn't seem to know, he didn't come across like knowing. Maybe he knew and just didn't convey it. That, to me, was that he did not have the knowledge that I expect from a leader. You know what I'm saying? Irrespective well, of from the commander-in-chief. Irrespective of anything else, that's me. That's my standards. And if I, if I was working with a copywriter and they didn't know what a Johnson box was, granted, you don't have to know the name, but it's a sign that you were not well-trained. It's a sign that you have gaps in your knowledge. So if somebody out there doesn't know the Johnson box, they need to start reading books. I mean, you know, you need to know what... You, you don't know who Frank Johnson is. Okay, maybe you don't need to know who Frank Johnson, although he was one of the leaders. He was, he was a great man, too. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a sign that you're not educated, that you're not skilled. It's sort of like when you see a letter without a PS. Well, that's not that's an amateur. That tells me it's an, you're an amateur. Or you're very arrogant and think you don't need one, you know, one of those type people. I don't know which is worse. To be an amateur or arrogant, you're probably both. <laughs> it could be uh, an amateur because you're arrogant. It could be. It could be. <clears throat> well, anyway, um, my last chapter that I read is Chapter 7, uh, Deathless Prose. And I'm reminded of the Dead Poets Society. At the, do you remember that movie with Robin Williams? Williams? Yeah. Yep. And one of the things he does is, is there's a really boring introduction 
and he and 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 the guy seems to say that poetry can be like judged like a math thing. You know what I'm saying? You, you have this and that, and, and it, it's really weak. And Robin Williams has him tear it out of the book. Well, the headmaster you know, is upset about it because they want conformity. Well, conformists don't really write good copy generally. It, 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 there's some exceptions, but generally people that are um, free thinking, which is, you know, those are typically the best copywriters. Uh, they're, not, they're not people that are conformists. And, and poetry in particular, it's, it's more spiritual. It's not something you can measure. And what you like as a poem, I might Did it not. move you? Did, yeah, I mean, you, you might... You and might, the same thing with direct mail. Did it move you to action? Right. You, 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 we all have different interests. You know, you, you know, I might like the Charge of Light Brigade. You may not. You know, it's, that's the kind of thing. Um, people have different things. Uh, the last thing I'll leave you with. The more skillful the writing, the more invisible the act of creation. I like that. Really good writing. You don't even notice how well written it is because it's just smooth. You know, like a good, uh, I don't know, bourbon or something or, or a cognac. It's just smooth. You know, it's, uh, that's how you, how, you, how you grade that. You just, oh, that's smooth. No, and I think that's where the real relationship building comes in. Right. You enjoyed that experience. That's maybe why we don't have the retention rates and house mailings aren't as good just because people don't spend as much time with them as they do with their prospect package, I think. I see that. That's a shame because, uh, you know, I, I, I came across something, Jerry Huntsegger. Oh, uh, he's very good. Down yeah. in Richmond. Yeah. Uh, he had his own agency, Hun- Huntsinger Jeffers. For yeah, yeah, still around, yeah. And uh, he wrote about uh, direct mail as entertainment. Yes. And I really think uh, House Appeals, you know, I, as a copywriter, and I'll, I'll boil this story down to 45 seconds. Uh, <clears throat> copywriters, you know, when we're doing that, resend the house mailings for a new offer for, to give again. Uh, we struggle a lot of times with a reason to write. It can't just be, oh, the group needs more money. Right. It has to be important to you. Right. And I struggled. You know, it's so obvious for a veterans uh, care package group to hit you up for Veterans Day and Christmas and things like that. Uh, but I was trying to tie it to something else. And I thought, you know what? There's Halloween. Yeah, you did your trick-or-treat package. I did trick-or-treat for the troops in a clear tube that had a Halloween bag in it, nylon bag. For the Wasp, I did Valentine's Day one time. Well, there you go. Yeah. Women and uh, pilots there. Yeah. And uh, you know what? Uh, those packages cost a lot more to do, mailing out in the tube. It usually pays off. In fact, I, I can't think of when it has in a tube mailing that hasn't done better than normal. Well, I had a reason to do the tube. You have to have I a had reason. to send that. You and I told them, I said, you know, I want you to tie this luggage tag cardboard luggage tag with strings to the handle of this trick-or-treat bag and we're going to stuff it full of treats and send it in a care package trick-or-treat for the troops people loved it well anyway we didn't i didn't get through the whole book there's no way to do that it's around 300 pages or so let me see so 391 almost 400 pages it's worth it though so winning direct response advertising by joan throckmorton may she rest in peace her her lessons live on don't they they certainly do. There's a certain immortality to writing a book, especially one as good as that. And Very I have cute. my autograph. <laughs> you copy. have your autograph. That's right. Okay, well, you and can't get that anymore. James, congratulations on your golden anniversary here. 50, <laughs> 50 shows. Yeah, this is around 50 minutes. <laughs> this is like one of our longest. Well, anyway, till next time, this is Donor Doctor signing out. Bye.